wonderful. Well, without further ado, it is my very great pleasure and Pearson's great honor to introduce Mike Rose, although he really needs no introduction. Uh, Mike is a professor of soci uh, social research methodology at UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies and the author of such seminal and award-winning works as Lives on the Boundary, The Struggles and Achievements of America's Educationally Underprepared, Possible Lives, The Promise of Public Education in America, and The Mind at Work, Valuing the Intelligence of the American Worker. His most recent book is Why School? Reclaiming Education for Us All. Mike is currently involved in Pathways to Post-Secondary Success, part of a five-year study focusing on maximizing opportunities for low-income youth to earn higher education, education credentials. Mike's session today is based around your questions. When registering, we asked you to submit questions for Mike, and he's taken those questions and will be addressing several of them in his pre presentation today. You can send in more questions, again, through that questions box on the screen. And at the end of Mike's talk, we will read as many of them as we can and have Mike answer your questions. Uh, but without further ado, Mike, uh, you are on the air. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for all those kind words. Um, so let me start by telling you what I did here. Uh, as, as Megan said, you folks were nice enough to send in a lot of questions. Uh, we got about 25 of them, in fact. And they were terrific because they, they gave me some focus. And what I did was I took as many as I could and clustered them into five or six topics that it seemed to me um, address those questions. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to start uh, with the first one, which um, which is this one: How do you help students understand the value of education? How do you help students understand the value of education? And you know the the, the first thing that I always do. Is, is get people to talk about or maybe write about um, why they're here, you know, why they're at this college or this program, um, what it is that brings them here, what do they want from this, what's the motivators. And that, I think, is, is a good way to get that discussion going. That is, what is the purpose and the value of education? Now, many people will say, well, you know, I'm here because I want to try and uh, you know, get a good job, or um, particularly if you're in in a community college um, and in a credentialing program, or people who are trying to um, uh, get some sort of a certification and maybe also doing their AA or AS degree. Of course, they're there because they want to try and improve their economic lot. But what's really been interesting to me and is that. Even in situations where folks are coming to college or coming back to college because they desperately need to get an economic leg up, that even there, it's so um, telling to me that they often mention a number of other reasons as well. And I'll just give you some that I heard um, at a trade technical community college that I've been spending time at. Uh, in a recent orientation, people started to talk about and write about the fact that they they also, in addition to wanting to get a better job, they wanted to be able to better help their kids in school or be a role model for their kids. They also talked about wanting to learn new things. They talked about wanting to be able to read or write or speak better. Um, they talked about wanting to turn their life around. Uh, so there were all kinds of other reasons that came forth in addition to the economic one. So I, I, I'm, I'm just taken with the fact that, that schooling is such a potent and powerful um, thing in our culture that when we get people to talk about why they're in school, why they're here, what brought them to school or brought them back to school, that sometimes we really then get the germs of some, some interesting discussions about education. One more thing to say about this, of course, is that, and I know lots and lots and lots of teachers do this, is to try and get at least some readings uh, on the topic or uh, about people who are in some ways like the people in the classroom. 
um, people with similar backgrounds or people trying to find out who they are and what they want to do or people who are exploring in various ways. Um, I know that, that um, mentioned, uh, Megan mentioned Lives on the Boundary. I know there's a section out of there called I Just Want to Be Average that people tend to use a lot um, in, in college freshman courses because it does start to raise some of those kinds of issues about schooling and finding one's way in school. So those are some thoughts of mine about um, the questions that had to do with how you help students understand the value of education. You know, as always, you start with them, you start where they are, and you start to try and, and have them generate uh, the means to get to a rich conversation about purpose and goals of education. A second cluster of questions uh, had to do with the issue of how to teach students academic English or academic discourse uh, without in some ways compromising their, um, their culture or their voice or their origins, um, their own languages, and whatnot. Um, and, and that cluster of questions is always an interesting one to me, that, those issues. Um, First of all, I want to offer something that I've thought a lot about. I thought about uh, something that I have thought a lot about, and that's we want to be careful to not adopt too rigid a notion of culture. That is, don't assume that automatically um, trying to teach someone a way to write um, or present themselves that is not familiar to them or not comfortable to them or not part of their current repertoire to not automatically assume that that's going to be damaging in some way. Again, I think culture is a richer and more dynamic and more fluid notion than that. Culture, in fact, is usually a blend, a hybrid of all sorts of strands and backgrounds and languages and cultural practices and whatnot. So that's the first thing I guess I would say in response to that cluster of questions. Then the second thing I would say is I find it really valuable. Uh, and as I watch teachers in a lot of settings that, who I admire, they, they tend to do something like this. And that is to make explicit what you're trying to do, that is, you're you're in the business of trying to um, provide people with multiple linguistic resources, with um, the facility to handle a kind of language and in a way that maybe they're not completely proficient with yet. I, I think of an old article of Lisa Delpit's where she talks about the importance of providing people, especially people who um, you know, are in some way behind the economic or social eight ball, people who have not had all the advantages, how important it is to teach them what she refers to as the language of power. And I think that, that making explicit that purpose uh, of yours as a teacher, I mean, it usually resonates because just about every student that I've ever seen wants to do well, even, even if he or she is struggling. They want to do well, and part of doing well is knowing how to handle language in this particular way that is the coin of the realm in the academy. The third point I'd make is that if conflicts arise around this or tensions or difficulties, that those become really rich topics of discussion, um, topics themselves that can be written about, spoken about, people put in groups. and, and and chew on. So potential conflicts between the kinds of uh, writing language that you're trying to teach that becomes the language of survival in college, uh, conflicts, possible conflicts between that and, and uh, language practices that are more familiar to students, that becomes an interesting set of issues itself. And then finally, there's all kinds of ways, and I know that probably everybody listening to this presentation does this in some way or another. You work in outside materials, um, materials outside of school, outside of the academy, outside of the disciplines. You work them into the curriculum. And in fact, you can do it in a way that blends with the academic material. So uh, 
one particularly skillful teacher I saw in, in a, a local community college likes to do a thing with style. So we'll give some uh, some readings uh, or lead a discussion on some kinds of oh some definitions or uh, anthropological perspectives on the notion of style, and then ask students to bring in examples and write about examples of style uh, in in the fashion or music um, or film video that surrounds them. Um, so, so there's a number of ways then that I think that we can begin to um, go about this enterprise of trying to bring folks into these discourse communities without um, compromising who they are and, in fact, adding to who they are. And the final thing to say about that is it's a two-way street. We can also use who they are and what they know and to push back or alter um, in some ways to challenge uh, the academic work. So we've got a, in, in a book that Mel Canary and I did called Critical Strategies for Academic Reading and Writing, this is a textbook, we have exercises, we have some exercises like the following. We give people a number of excerpts from uh, literature written by uh, immigrant authors, uh, people who have might immigrated to the United States, uh, and and these um, so these are accounts in some way or another of some aspect of immigrant life, and we also give them uh, an academic uh, discussion, a piece of a, of an article on quote unquote culture shock. You know that notion of of being jostled and startled and shocked and by uh, one's new cultural experience. And then what we ask them to do is to use that academic um, conceptualization of culture Jacques and apply it to these passages uh, uh, on immigrant experience. And if there's anybody in the class who themselves are immigrant students or whose parents have migrated or who in some way or another are close to the immigrant experience, to bring that experience in as well and to use it to test that um, definition or conceptualization of culture shock. Is it too rigid? Is it um, uh, removed from the experience that they know? So there's ways then that we can, as I say, make this a reciprocal relationship we are trying to socialize folks into a particular way of writing because we know that that's going to help them advance towards their goals. But also, we can use all kinds of other experience and other kinds of writing to enrich and um, make more interesting and hybridize, I guess, in a way, the, the kinds of reading and writing that surround them in the academy. A third category of questions that I got uh, from you folks, in some way or another, deal with the following. That is, how do you get reluctant writers to write or to trust or use their own voice? Or in some way or another, to, to get folks who, in, in whatever way, um, are just not getting words on paper or on the screen. So some of the things I'm going to suggest for this are ones that you're familiar with, right? Good old free writing, where you just you know, sort of suspend some of the concerns of, uh, about conventions and let people just scribble what's on their mind. Hand in glove with that, I'm a big fan of initiating in-class discussion either around a topic you present or some readings that they do or things that they're, uh, topics that they're told to uncover themselves. And from those discussions, to have people do some quick writing on what was being discussed, because there's this wonderful interrelation, of course, that we don't tap into enough between oral work and written work. And so to generate a good discussion and get people going with it and then have them take a few minutes to scribble some thoughts out, 
you don't even need to look at them or collect them necessarily, or maybe you'd roam around the room and look over some shoulders or something, but just to get people to move from speech, which might be more um, readily available to them, and then to get them to, to, to start to write. You can also do here the kind of thing I just described earlier with that uh, exercise from critical strategies, the, the one where we draw on the immigrant experience. And that's, again, a way to pull their experience into the classroom, uh, which m might well give them a more personal, um, emotional set of topics to write from, which, again, can sometimes be enough to get folks to open up. The final thing I want to mention here is, is takes a different tack, but I, I couldn't help but think as I was I was putting these questions together under this broader category, I couldn't help to think of an early study that I did on writer's block, and some of you folks are probably familiar with it. Um, but but what I did was did a, a very careful uh, uh, study, uh, writing process study of students who reported a great deal of difficulty getting words on paper and students who were quite fluent. And what emerged from that study was just the degree to which some of the kinds of things that we've learned in school or maybe mislearned, you know, maybe nobody actually taught them to us, but it's what we ended up thinking they were telling us. Um, the way these various rules and strategies and assumptions about writing, the way those can really tie people up. So I think it's worth remembering, too, that sometimes, and this goes along with the free writing, I think, it might be worthwhile to get people to begin to think about, write about, talk about the things that they see as their roadblocks, the kinds of things that they think stand in their way. Because what will sometimes merge is such a, a, a whole cluster of maxims and rules and strategies about what writing should look like and do and be that it becomes paralyzing, particularly if you're not um, really proficient with written language. So I think that's another road to go down, right, to, to, to get them to think about, reflect on what they think might be standing in their way. Uh, things that they maybe have learned or assumptions that they have about writing or academic writing. That goes down uh, the path that Minas Shaughnessy opened up for us, right? The various beliefs or assumptions that students might have about what academic writing ought to look like. All of that becomes a really rich source, I think, for to get, to, to get people to talk about their own writing histories and the various rules, strategies, assumptions, beliefs that might be standing in their way. A fourth category of question, um, something like this. Um, people, some people asked about how my research interests in cognition, and we've been talking about that a little bit, how my research interests in cognition inform my teaching and my thinking about education. Well, I just gave you an example about uh, the way that my training and orientation for cognition, cognitive science, cognitive psychology um, can work with student writers. And I'll say just a little bit more about it here, that for me what the cognitive perspective provided is that it, it calls attention to, as I said, things like rules and strategies and assumptions and belief, beliefs that can sometimes be um, tripping people up. It also, for me, makes you look at error in an interesting way. So as opposed to just thinking, you know, you see something that's, that's uh, wrong in a sentence, uh, syntax is off, it's a fragment, something's not working right, instead of just automatically assuming that the person doesn't know how to write a sentence or doesn't know about sentence boundaries and launching into some kind of a little lesson on that, I think asking a question or two in a quick conference um, as to what the person was trying to do might reveal r real riches, uh, real pedagogical riches. Because sometimes what lies behind error, again, are sets of rules and assumptions and beliefs that uh, are open to revision. 
Um, so I, I find this whole approach to be really helpful in the teaching of writing. On a broader level, on a much broader level, this interest of mine in, in cognition uh, led me to do all the kind of work that led to the book The Mind at Work, which um, is this attempt to articulate, to study and then articulate the rich range of intelligence involved in work that tends to be kind of lower on the status ladder and ladder on the status ladder in our culture, and that's blue collar and service work. And so to be able to use this cognitive framework to investigate and render uh, the rich intelligence involved in the work that makes the world go round really provided a nice avenue for me to think about in a critical way various kinds of class and occupational distinctions that we tend to make automatically in the society. Um, even the very split in the comprehensive high school in the last hundred years uh, between the academic and the vocational courses of study um, makes me again just wonder if that very split, although I understand the historical reasons that it came about, that if that very split doesn't lead us to a whole lot of problems itself. So both on the immediate kind of pedagogical level of teaching writing, I have found this cognitive approach to be useful. Um, and in a broader sense, thinking about these uh, uh, more philosophical and social uh, issues of intelligence, education, occupational status, all of that, um, this work has also been really a wonderful lever to open up a kind of critical perspective on those social issues. Another topic that came up is one that's that's in the news today, and uh, I don't mean the six o'clock news, but certainly in in our circles, our writing circles, and that is uh, accelerated programs, and that is the the attempt to um, see if we can get basic writing, remedial courses, um, if we can some ways compress them. You know, as you know, at some schools there are three or four even courses that a student potentially would have to take before taking the English composition course. And what we have found again and again with studies is that very, very few students make it through that whole sequence. That it just becomes, um, it becomes a kind of trap, right, where people are stuck. Um, they, they don't make it from one course to the next in any significant numbers, and very few complete the sequence and move on to composition. Because of that, then, some folks are trying to th they're asking the question, well, is it possible that we really don't need that number of courses? That is, that we could create rich reading and writing environments where people are immersed in language, admittedly have to work pretty hard, but are immersed in language in a way that gets to some of the concerns that those four courses would cover grammar, mechanics, syntactic issues, basic um, basic discourse construction, all of that, that can get to that maybe in a, in a quicker way. Um, it's an interesting time, I think. I think some of those experiments are, are compelling. And some people who have been trying to take their own data on it have found, have found some really good results that people get through the more abbreviated sequence just fine and do OK in the composition course. The reason I think that it's worth considering the accelerated model is because I think that there are some understandable but problematic assumptions that underlie uh, the three or four courses that are part of the basic writing or remedial continuum. You know, oftentimes they start 
at the sentence level, and then the next course will be paragraph and and then on up. And the notion here are, are there, there's a couple notions that are part and parcel of the remedial enterprise in our country. And one is that the way that we that we take care of a problem is to break the problem down to its tiniest element. So in this case, breaking um, language written language problems down to the level of punctuation and sentence construction and mechanics, and then inching your way up piece by piece. Um, I think another thing is that a lot of people believe, and, and again, not for the wrong reasons. I mean, I think that it's a justifiable ex um, assumption that that to, to give people too much too soon, to immerse them in difficult material and demanding kinds of assignments, that it might be just damaging. Right? It might be so overwhelming for students that they would not be able to handle it and drop out. But I think that both of those assumptions are really worth investigating and worth challenging. In my own experience, I found that, um, that people often can handle material beyond what we think, at least at the level of discussion and um, the, the discussion of ideas. And then we can think of ways to get them to begin to move that discussion to writing. And again, with a lot of, I don't want to deny the fact that it might involve a lot of um, ancillary support, uh, tutorial support, and whatnot, but it's worth a try, I think, because again, of those really troubling statistics that so few students make it toward the sequence, through the sequence. The final thing to say about this, though, is that even though I am very interested in these moves toward accelerated sequences, I think that a concern that many people have and that I share is that you don't want to be glib or um, Pollyannish about the degree to which some folks really have serious uh, difficulties with written language. So we don't want to gloss that over with happy talk, right? We don't want to accelerate in the sense of speeding through or speeding by, but rather make sure that whatever it is that we are doing in an accelerated program really does have a kind of depth and richness and support systems built into it that it will do what needs to be done. And they need to be studied. We need to see if they work. So they need to be evaluated. Uh, finally, let me get to, uh, there, were, there were also questions that came in uh, with a very practical bent and, and focused on just techniques and that. Let me pick a couple of those. Because again, I think they were representative of some of the kinds of questions. And then we'll be able to take questions from you folks. So here's a few questions on practice and technique. And one of them is uh, someone asked, actually several people asked a version of this, uh, what, what are some techniques to not write over long commentary on papers, especially uh, when teachers have large teaching loads and the classes are heavily enrolled. So the first thing I want to say is that not all writing has to be assessed, right? I'm a big fan, I think I mentioned this earlier, I'm a big fan of having people do all kinds of little quick hit writing things every day in class, right? So that you're having a discussion or about a something that they've read or something that they saw or, or something involved, you know, something in the syllabus. And, and I often like to do things like say, okay, just take a few minutes. I want you to uh, you know, uh, jot down a thought about this or jot down a one-sentence summary of what we've been talking about or, or what would be the next possible step one might take in this discussion, just something like that, right? And then get people to read them, get a few people to read them. Let's hear what you had to say, Sam, and let's hear what you had to say, Laura. Um, but they don't have to all be collected and looked at. Also, I've seen a lot of people do this and, and, and uh, do it effectively. Uh, you, can, you can do some responding to papers in small conferences in class, right? Particularly when people are working through revisions. Um, uh, either moving uh, desk to desk or group to group. Uh, or having folks come up to your desk and having a little timer on the 
the desk. I mean, really, so that each person gets three or four minutes or whatever, just enough for you to be able to pinpoint one or two things that someone could work on. Uh, group work, I mentioned, certainly becomes another vehicle uh, when organized well for students to work on revisions of the papers they're working on. And then they can come to office hours with particular concerns that emerged from that, uh, from the group work. And again, more conferencing can go on within the office hour. So, so far we've covered then a number of ways that don't require actual commenting on papers, but do provide either an opportunity to write or an opportunity to write and get some kind of response. Finally, there's the good old principle of zeroing in on a few error patterns at a time. I think especially new teachers feel, and, and, and I understand this, and it's, it's actually a sign of tremendous responsibility that they're taking on. A few, I think a lot of new teachers feel like they have to mark everything that they see that's not working right because otherwise they're shirking their duties. And what I have found is that, yeah, you, you don't want to, you certainly don't want to give people an incorrect assessment of where they are, but you can give them some kind of a global uh, assessment of where they are and then zero in on one or two patterns of error that you see. That is something that's not happening just once, but something that's going on several times or more in the paper problems with comma splices, let's say, or uh, a subject-verb agreement pattern that is repeating itself, or more at the discourse level, let's say a tendency toward not providing evidence or staying at the level of generalization, uh, looking for patterns of that kind and pointing out those patterns can be much more instructive and useful to someone than just getting a paper back with a ton of uh, marks on it uh, that they might not necessarily, that, that first of all might overwhelm and then second of all they might not necessarily understand. Here's another question and then I'll open it up to you. This was another specific question about technique and that is how to make writing conferences more effective. So I'm assuming here that the person means those conferences in your office or if you um, construct your class in a way that certain days are conference days, that is where people are coming up uh, and spending a short amount of time with you at the desk. So in either case, um, again, I mentioned this thing of a timer, and I know that a lot of people feel that that, I don't know, it sounds odd or maybe seems a little bit ele elementary schoolish, but I find it immensely useful, and it guarantees you that the first person doesn't get 45 minutes and the last poor soul gets two minutes, right? So I find that using a timer and having a predetermined number of minutes that each person will get uh, is a way to ensure fairness and also efficiency. And if more needs to be dealt with, then maybe office hours are used or uh, further office hours or um, some kind of online connection that, that uh, that you can have that, that allows a student to pursue those particular issues further. Something else that I think is useful and that I've seen people do and use well is that, you know, what sometimes happens with conferences is that folks just, just kind of come walking in with their paper and put it down and look at you to begin to do your magic. But in fact, if you give them some kind of a set of instructions beforehand, a little handout or a worksheet or something, um, that just has them do a few things with that paper before they bring it into you. You know, to ask themselves, um, what is it you think you need to work on here? Or where is it that you are having the most trouble? Or what part of this do you feel the best about? So some, sort, some small set of questions that get them thinking about the conference beforehand and getting ready for it and for you. And then again, I think once you're with them, a way to make the conference more effective is to look for those patterns of problems, or for that fact, you know, we, we never think this way, but patterns of things that work well, the kinds of things that um, you want to really encourage. So those are the end of the, uh, those are the, those are the, the 
uh, clusters of questions I got. I tried to cover as many as I could. Um, and uh, now I think we're ready to open it up if, if listeners have some, questions, some further questions they want to shoot my way. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, we do have some questions coming in. And uh, here's one from Michelle Jarvis of Davidson County Community College in North Carolina. She says, North Carolina universities do not provide, quote unquote, remediation for underprepared freshmen. Instead, the students are referred to the local community college for preparatory work. This decision was driven partly by the concept that the state has already paid for those educational skills once through the public school system and should not pay for them again at the university level. Ironically, the state will pay for these costs again through the community college. What are your thoughts or feelings about the consequences of refusing to offer remediation at the university level and of quote unquote relegating underprepared students to the community college? What are the impacts on the student, the university, the community college, and the community at large? Well, it's a terrific question, and, and that sort of thing has been going on for some time. I mean, I remember those same, uh, the same set of issues and the same battles going on here in California 20, 25 years ago when I was just starting to be involved with the writing program at UCLA. Um, this attempt to move remediation off of the four-year campus and to the community college. And there's usually several justifications. One is that's not university level or college level work. And the second is that classic phrase that she used, that the legislators always used, and that is that they've already paid once for this, so they shouldn't pay for it again, although they are paying for it again. So there's a little politico speak involved there, I think. Um, you know, I've written a lot about this, and so so I'll give you a quick answer, but would also like to refer folks to some of the some of the stuff I've written, and and actually they are in several of those essays are in Y School. I'm not trying to give a plug here, but they're in Y School, or people can find them online because some of them have been published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, or or some other or Inside Higher Ed, or some of these places. Um, it has to do, to my mind, it has to do with the way we think about giving people a second chance. And we see ourselves as a second chance society. It's one of the, it's one of the qualities of our country that we're proud about. Um, yes, it's, it's miserably unfortunate that so many folks show up at the doorstep of college uh, the doorsteps of a college and and have not gotten the skills that perhaps they should have gotten. But that's the case. And the reason that they don't have them, there's multiple reasons. There's this automatic assumption in that we've already paid for them business that, you know, folks have had these courses and had these courses and had these courses and just never got them. But there's so many variations on that theme. There's people who actually haven't had some of that kind of training. Um, there's other people who have been away from it for a long time and they're coming back to school. There's uh, ELL students and immigrant students and international students. I mean, there's a whole range of reasons why folks end up needing a remedial course at a college. So I think the first thing to say is, you know, look, we're a second chance society, so let's put our money where our mouth is. The second thing to say is, I think that these folks paint this group of students with a with a single brush stroke when in fact it's quite a hetero heterogeneous lot. And the third thing I think is that um, if remedi if quote unquote remedial courses are done well, if they're done with the kind of intellectual integrity that I think they can be done with, then in fact they do tap into a, a lot of issues and material that are indeed college level. Now, as they're doing that, yes, they are trying to take care of a lot of other language issues that may be more basic, but it's the integration of the basic issues in with the big stuff, I think, the, the larger um, uh, kinds of educational materials and issues that we can talk about that, that can make a remedial course a really powerful and certainly intellectually legitimate course. So those are just some quick thoughts about, about that. But 
I just want to tell the person who asked the question that this, we've been up this tree before. This battle has been, uh, or this conflict or whatever you want to call it, has been going on for a long time in a number of states. Great. Um, we have a question from Teresa Alto from Itzaca Community College. Although I believe in open access to education, do you think that young people are given too universally the message that if they don't go to college, they will be failures? Do we insist too much on the ideal or the myth that everyone should become educated? Um, gosh, is this narcissistic if I refer to something else of mine? I, um, so I have a blog, and I'd invite I'd invite all the listeners who, who are interested, you can go to my blog, and it's microsebooks.blogspot.com. And the current piece that's up there addresses this very issue, and so I would love the reader to take a look at it. Um, you know, in a nutshell, this, is a, th this issue is much in the news right now because you're getting a lot of, so, so on the one hand, and it's in the news because on the one hand, in the last decade or so, we've had a real push for a kind of college for all approach, right? a whole college for all mentality. So in my state of California, for example, there's been a push, there was a push a while back that, that all students might enter a, um, oh, I'm sorry, it might have just been in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm a little punchy right now, but either in LA or in the state, there was a push that all students would automatically be placed into a college preparatory curriculum, which they then could opt out of. But that would be the automatic route, right? And that's just one example of the many, many ways that there's been this attempt to instill a kind of college for all mentality among young people and in the culture at large. That is admirable, and I understand its purpose, and I'm on board with a lot of what that's about, given the fact that so many people who have been counseled away from or shut out from post-secondary education, a lot of those people are poor people, people of color, immigrant students, and so there's been a real history of injustice, and we all, and, and anybody who's studied the issue knows that. There's been a real history of injustice in the way access is either provided or denied to post-secondary education. So I completely understand the impulse of the college for all. Also, you know, we're in the middle of a, of a economic um, bust right now where we're hearing this rhetoric about educating our way to the 21st century economy. Secretary of Education uses that phrase a lot, and the president even used it in a recent address. That is, we can educate our way to economic prosperity, and the way to do that is through post-secondary education. So this is really in the air. Now, there's a pushback that's been coming from economists and other folks who have been observing, well, gee, wait a minute. Um, there are a lot of good and decent jobs out there that don't require a four-year degree. They may require some kind of post-secondary training, but did not, did not at all require a four-year degree. And second of all, isn't there a kind of hidden class bias going on here? That is the assumption that, you know, unless you come out of a four-year college with some kind of a liberal studies or liberal arts degree, that somehow you're lesser of a person. So this is a really interesting cultural conflict right now, and it's one that doesn't have an easy answer. Um, but I think that, that uh, it's one that we need to think through carefully. There's no one simple magic bullet it's not just a magic bullet to throw every kid into an algebra course and um, and shoot that student then toward a four-year university because or college because it's just not going to happen. We know that for all kinds of reasons, and and some of the experiments with that sort of thing, like I was mentioning a bit ago, have yielded some really unfortunate results. On the other hand, we have to be very careful about the history history of social inequality that underlies this business of who goes to school and who doesn't. And then finally, I think we do have to think hard about the fact that there are ways to make a good and sustained and decent living doing meaningful work uh, that don't require a four-year degree, although they do require 
but those jobs do require some kind of post-secondary training. And in hand and glove with that, what kind of post-secondary training do we provide? I think that's the further question. Is it just a basic job training, or can we use that? Can we use that opportunity to provide um, a really good education geared toward some kind of occupational goal? So these are all questions, and I would uh, direct the person and anybody else who's interested to look at that, that uh, last blog post of mine. Great, and we have um, unfortunately only time for one more question, um, and we have many questions that have come through. So what we will do to those of you who um, haven't had your um, questions addressed, we'll email those to Mike and, and see if he can respond. Um, but for now, here's our final question of the day. It's from Cornelia Wells at Arizona State University. Um, and she asked, Mike, could you address your take on the following anti-democratic trend as excerpted from this article in the Washington Post. And the article is, Texas passes controversial social study standards. Um, author Michael Birnbaum uh, says that the Texas State School Board gave final approval Friday to controversial social study standards that minimize the separation of church and state and say that America is not a democracy, but a constitutional republic. And uh, the sum of those the beliefs of those who made the changes. Um, the origins of the country were a Christian land governed by Christian principles. The new standards say that the McCarthyism of the 1950s was later vindicated. They also removed references to capitalism and replaced them with the, free ter the term free enterprise system. So what are your opinions about that sort of? Well, it's the culture wars, right? I mean, Geez, I mean, we're seeing it in so many ways, and it is playing out big time in this election. Um, so many of the, geez, so so many of the the attacks made on um, the on the Obama on Obama's on Obama's presidency and on Democrats. Those attacks. Some of those attacks are include these kinds of elements, right? And some of the Tea Party folks certainly hold to these ultra-libertarian beliefs on one hand, and on the other hand, the, um, deeply sectarian religious beliefs. And then this other cluster of beliefs that that the that the person is referring to, that in some way or another try to call into question things that seem so basic to us, the 14th Amendment, for example, being called into question, or um, uh, this, I, I wasn't familiar with this Texas case, but you know, trying to substitute one set of words for another with that, that are obviously loaded. And um, I mean, I, I just think we're at, a, we're at a really complicated and difficult time, and historians are going to look back on it as one of those really right-wing, uh, one of those right-wing swings in the in the nation's political culture. Um, the only thing that gives me hope is that we know from history as well that we swing back out of this. Um, I do think that I do think that even though there's this terrible streak in our uh, political culture, uh, I just don't think it's going to dominate. I think it's going to create havoc for a while, and it clearly is. But I do think that there's going to be a kind of homeostasis and a swing back, because some of what's being proposed is also tied to the removal of things that Americans have come to really value, whether it's Social Security or Medicare or various kinds of entitlement programs, um, I think when they begin to see what some of these beliefs, where they lead us, even though at the moment they may fuel anger and feel righteous, I think folks are going to, I think there's going to be um, a kind of a balancing, uh, although in the short run it makes things really chaotic. And all of this, it seems to me, becomes really wonderful material to bring into the college classroom, right? I mean, because students are living right in the middle of it. So 
Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, I wasn't familiar with that, that move in Texas, but it certainly doesn't surprise me, and it fits with so much else that's going on around the country right now. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this has just been wonderful. We have been so happy to have you with us today. I hope everybody enjoyed Mike's discussion, um, and... And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the conference. For those of you who've been on all day or whether you just joined us now for Mike, uh, we hope it's been a good experience for you. We've been very proud to host it. And um, that's it. And Mike, thank you again. I really appreciate your time and that oh, you joined us. It's my pleasure. And thanks to everybody for listening. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody, and have a great evening.